Reading at Daniel, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Daniel, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. The word of God declares as I read, And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of the people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. I want to be in that first group. What do you say? Those who are raised from the dust of the, of the earth to everlasting life. Well, beloved, we all can be in that group if we will follow the instructions of the Word of God. It's not what I have to say that's important, but it's what Jesus has to say that is important. Michael, who is Michael that shall stand up? Meaning, Christ has finished his work of intercession on behalf of humanity. Probation has closed. Let's read it, Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12, where the word of God tells us this. Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12. At that time, when Michael shall stand up, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. Case closed. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Case closed. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. When Michael stands up, it's over, beloved. Our cases are finalized. So what we've got to do now between the standing up of Michael and today is arrive at the truth of God's word and then live it. What do you say? Verse 12 says, And behold... I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Notice the screen. We are told that in every age... In every age there is given to men their day of light and privilege. That's what we have today. A probationary time in which they may become reconciled to God. But there is a limit to his grace. Mercy may plead for years and be slighted and rejected. But there comes a time when mercy makes her last plea. Time's up. We must now face the God of heaven. The heart becomes so hardened that it ceases to respond to the Spirit of God. Then the sweet winning voice re entreats the sinner no longer, and reproofs and warnings cease. The Jewish nation was a symbol of the people of all ages who scorned the pleadings of infinite love. He walked among them, and yet they refused to even know him. 
the tears of Christ when he wept over Jerusalem were for the sins of all time. So he weeps over our sins. In the judgments pronounced upon Israel, those who reject the reproofs of God's Holy Spirit may read their own condemnation. Did you get that one, beloved? In the judgments pronounced upon Israel, those who reject the reproofs of God's Holy Spirit may read their own condemnation. Let me read Matthew 23. Matthew 23. And I'm reading at verse 37 and 38. Here the word of God declares, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her children under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And so a time came in 70 AD when Titus, a Roman general, came into Jerusalem and destroyed the city. Their house was left unto them desolate. 1 Peter 1.12 tells us this, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, in remembrance of these things, though you know them. So that gives us the thought, beloved, that what we are about to, 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 to study this morning, Peter had already told his people this. They had been forewarned, and so he didn't want them to forget, and now he's repeating it. So this morning we will repeat some things that you perhaps have known. Though you know them, and be established in present truth. What is present truth? Truth that is relevant for today, meaningful for today. Truth that sort of pulls us by the lapel and says, listen, you need to wake up. Let me take you to a text. Go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. And there I'm reading at verses 20 and 21. Proverbs 22 the word of God declares as I read. Have not I written to thee excellent things in counsels and knowledge that I might make thee unto the, that I might make thee know the certainty. Notice that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of of truth. God is not hiding anything from us. I'm reading now in Amos 3 7. Notice what the prophet Amos says. Amos 3. I'm reading at verse 7. Amos 3. Surely the Lord God will do nothing or allow nothing to happen. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Isn't it amazing that many of your New Testament churches today have nothing to do with the Old Testament? They say salvation is in the New Testament. Well, that's true, but salvation is also in the Old Testament. I want to show you another text then. Let me read this one again. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but
but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Hold that in mind. Luke, Luke 13. I'm reading there at verse 28. There shall be gnash, weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. They had nothing to do with the Old Testament or the prophets of old. And thus, beloved, they missed the kingdom. So Peter again says, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. There's some things we need to know. Now this Michael fella, who is to stand up, close human history, end it all. Who is Michael? Or the head of the angels. All right, let's look at it. Michael, there are two texts I want you to look at. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Isaiah 9, verse 6. You see, it's not what I say that's important. It's what God declares that is important. Isaiah 9, 6 says this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Consular, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That is the Son of God, called by the name of Michael. Acts, the third chapter. Acts, the third chapter. Let's back it up with Acts, the third chapter, reading at verses 14 and 15. Acts, the third chapter, verses 14 and 15. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the prince. Who is the prince? Who is it they killed and killed the prince of life whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses? The prince Michael to whom we pray to whom we offer sacrifice, is going to stand up. And in that fearful time, after the close of Jesus' mediation, the saints were living in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. When Christ died on the cross, the Jews who were not accepting of him didn't realize their probation had closed. And so they continued to offer sacrifices in the sanctuary. It was of no avail. Why? The Lamb of God on the cross had already paid the debt. And the lambs that they were offering were of no consequence at all. So if they hadn't accepted the Lamb of God, who was there on the cross, the lambs that they were sacrificing, the four-legged lambs, meant nothing. So when Christ stands up, when the Michael stands up, and we're still praying. Ah, there's a text. Turn to Proverbs 28, verse 9. Notice what it says. And I would, pray, I would paraphrase it like this. If you don't want to obey, don't pray. Ooh! Now, that's what the Bible says. Let me show, let me show Proverbs 28, 9. What verse did I say? 28, 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer, read the rest, church, shall be an abomination. 28, 9. Proverbs 28, 9. All right. Thus the Bible tells us there will come a time when the Shekinah glory will be gone. The Shekinah glory, that bright light there in the earthly sanctuary, 
represented the presence of God. It was there that the priest would go, the high priest would go and plead with the God of heaven to forgive his people, to accept his people. There inside the ark, they called it the ark of God, was the Ten Commandments. When the priest would pray for their forgiveness, he was asking them to forgive them for the violation of the law of God. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Thus, beloved, the priest, having offered his prayers, the people, having ignored uh, the instruction given, God removes himself. You see, if you don't want him around, he will oblige you and he will leave. Thus the God of heaven says after his leaving, his pleading position, when he stands up, finishing his, his high priestly ministry, there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was. Now before that time of trouble, the God of heaven says this, just as soon as the people of God are sealed, let's read that over in Revelation 7. Notice this. Here's another book that is scound, uh, that is that is shunned uh, in our day. The Book of Revelation. I've heard preachers say, "Well, you can't understand that book." Well, here's what the book says: Revelation seven. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the tide, that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from, it, from the east, having the seal of the living God. Having the what? The seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to them, to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God. Sealed who? The servants of our God. In their foreheads. That's in the mind. Jesus prayed, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that comes, beloved, from taking time. Take time to be holy. Now, I'm not going to sing. I'll get all messed up like, like uh, what's the girl's name? Rachel. <laughs> Where's Rachel? Did Rachel leave? Okay. There she is. Okay, Rachel. Lord bless you. I was trying to sing, and, and I said, no, I, I'm not going to try and sing. So the Bible, the, the Word of God tells us, just as soon, now notice we're back on track, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, that's in the mind, it is not a seal or mark that can be seen, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually. You've got to know something, see? I know my, my, my grandparents who live in Portland, Oregon. When I was 11 years old, I went down to spend some time with them. And, and they're Pentecostals. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying anything about Pentecostals, but they would roll on the floor as a sign of, of receiving the Spirit. And so my grandfather said, son, don't look on the woman. Don't look on the women when they're in the Spirit. And I thought, well, you know, that's strange, isn't it? If the Holy Spirit is in them, what are they doing on the floor? So anyway, I've grown to know that's not proper etiquette, spiritual etiquette. All right, now notice, beloved. It says they will be intellectually and spiritually uh, settled into the truth so that they cannot be moved. Now, why, what, what is it that's going to move them? I'm going to show you in just a minute. 
just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking. Huh? Ever been in an earthquake? There's going to be a big one down here. It will come. The judgments of God are now upon the land to, to give us warning. The falling of the Holy Spirit. Watch this now. Only those who are living up to the light they have will receive greater light. Unless we are advancing in the exemplifications of the active Christian virtues, we shall not recognize the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in the latter reign. It may be falling all around us. Now, beloved, wake up and get this one. It may be falling all around us, but we shall not discern or receive it. So in essence, what is being said is if we're out of step with the Lord. See, 1 Peter 2.21. Let's, uh, let's go there and read it. Go to, go to 1 Peter 2.21. For hereunto were ye called, Christ having suffered for us, leaving us a, a record, leaving us a, an example. 1 Peter 1 Peter 2.21. Who has the text? Who has the text? Read it. Read it out loud, sister. Leaving us. Leaving us an example that you should do what? Follow what? His steps. Christ is our example that we should follow his steps. All right? So if we're following his steps, beloved, the Holy Spirit may be falling all around us and it will fall on us as well. But if we're not following his, his steps, notice what it says. But we shall not discern, that's understand, or receive it. God help us. Amen? to be in step with our Lord. Putting things in context. Now I want you to get the context. In Revelation 6, go to Revelation 6. Revelation 6 comes before Revelation 7. Now, in Revelation 6, starting at verse 14, notice the picture that is drawn. It's a word picture. But the heaven departed as a scroll. Are you there? Okay. Revelation 6, verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were what? Moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, that's, that's you know, rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, what did they do? Hid themselves in the rocks, of the, in the dens and the rocks of the, of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of who? The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. Now notice the question. Notice the question. And who shall be able to stand? All right? When the second coming takes place, Christ opens the heavens and he's coming back here. It'll be no secret. Psalm 50 tells you it's not a secret. He's going to let the world know, here I come. You see, at the cross, they said, if you're the son of God, come down, then we'll believe. Well, it wasn't time for him to come down. But when it's time, beloved, he'll open the heavens, and then you'll see it's time for him to come down. He will come to this world. Now notice, the question is, who shall be able to stand? It says that every bondman, every free man hid themselves 
in the dens and in the rocks. They were running away. But who's going to be able to stand and see the glory of our Lord coming in the clouds? Huh? Chapter 7 answers that question. Those who receive the seal of God. They will be able to stand. Now, beloved, the seal is a mark in the mind, in the void. All right? You'll remember, I'm getting ahead of myself here. You'll remember, remember the first time a mark was used in the Bible? It was used on Cain. Cain had killed his brother, and the Lord said, all right, you're out of here. He said, well, wait a minute. If I go out in the world, they'll, they'll see me and they'll kill me. You, my punishment is so great, it's too great. So God said, I'm going to put a mark on you. And those who see that mark are not going to touch you. So the mark, or the seal, the mark was for protection. Now, that's in Genesis 4, 14 and 15. So in Revelation 7, answers this question as to who will be able to stand. It is the people who have the seal, the protecting mark in their minds, upon their minds. It's not a seal that you can see. Now, some people say, well, in the end of the time, you're going to have this 666 on your forehead. No, that's not true. The seal of God will not be seen by human eyes, but the angels can see it. Now notice this. In the time of Israel, when they were to leave Egypt, the God of heaven said, do what with, with the blood of the lamb? Put it on the doorpost. And when the angel sees that mark, that blood, he will do what? Passover. Have you, have you heard the word Passover recently? It just, it just passed. The Jewish people, we were in Florida about two or three years ago, and Passover season came, and where we were having our service, the Jewish synagogue was just down the street, and Passover time brought the Jews out in number. They recognized that Old Testament when the Jews were saved by the mark, by the shedding or the blood that was put on the doorposts, which is a symbol of God's blood upon the heart, upon the life. All right? Thus, beloved, what is the seal of the living God? It is, which is placed in the foreheads of his people, it is a mark which angels, but not human eyes, can read. For the destroying angel must see this mark of redemption. Question, do you have the mark? Huh. Do you have the seal of God? I tell you where you can find it. When the time of trouble comes, every case is decided. There is no longer probation... No longer mercy for the impotent. The seal of the living God is upon his people. Courage, fortitude, faith, and implicit trust in God's power to save. Do not come in a moment. These heavenly graces are acquired by experience of years. Of experience of dwelling in the book. Taking time, oh my list, we need to take time to be holy. We need to speak off with our Lord, amen? amen? Now, beloved, let's go a step further. I want to highlight, I want to highlight the seal. The makeup of the seal of God has three parts. Now notice, the name, the title, and the territory. God's seal, his name is the Lord thy God. Is he your Lord? You see, if he's your Lord, according to 
Romans 6, 16, you will serve him. All right? Know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves servants to serve. His servants you are. Now, his title is creator. He created all things, and he created you. His territory is over the heavens and the earth. All right? Now Lord, notice, beloved, where can this seal be found? Where is the seal found? It is found in the Ten Commandments that were written by the finger of God. Exodus 31, 18 says so. Written by the finger of God, not on paper, but on stone. Why on stone? to show its enduring quality. You see, beloved, we live in an age when people say, well, away with the commandments of God. We don't need them anymore. Uh-huh. God says you do. Now, beloved, the seal is found within the fourth commandment. What does the fourth commandment say? Remember something. Remember what God wrote with his own finger. He, re he created the world in six days. Notice, first, second, and third. I want to stop just a moment at the fourth. Because on the fourth day, God did something special. Notice what he did on the fourth day. He put the lights in the firmament, sun, moon, and stars. And he did it for a specific purpose, not only to give light to the earth, but notice, beloved, what he did on the fourth day, Genesis 1.14 tells you, and God said, let there be lights where? In the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for what? Signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, in order, beloved, to mix up the days, you've got to adjust the sun, the moon, and the stars, because God put them in the heavens to designate days and years. It takes 365, and sometimes a leap year, but basically 365 days for the sun to go around, no, the earth to go around the sun, amen? That's a year. It takes about 30 days for the moon, which is our satellite, for the moon to go around the earth 30 days. How do you tell a week? How do you tell a week? It takes your eyes to go to the word of God and what he did to make a week. That's how you tell a week. Now, beloved, notice as we go down creation week. So the days of creation, number five, God put in water creatures and fowls. Evening and morning were the first, second, all the way to the sixth day. On the sixth day, God did a lot of work. He brought in living, living creature, cattle, creeping things, beasts. And then he brought man. That's where we come in. God created us. He, first of all, he made our house. He made the world. He made Eden. Everything was ready. So when we came into existence, there was nothing we had to do to make things ready. The same is true about salvation. Jesus paid it all. So all to him I owe. Amen? Thus, beloved, after this, the God of heaven finalized the week and he put down the seventh day. Now notice there's a difference between seven 
and one. We call one Sunday, named after the sun. We call uh, the seventh day, every Spanish country says it is Sabado. Sabado. Amen? Those of you who speak Spanish, I know that word, one of them. <laughs> Sabado, all right? Thus, beloved, because on that day God rested. God rested and to remember day one, day two, day three. The evening and the morning were. Day four, day five, day six. And then when he came to day seven, notice he did not say evening and morning. Read it in Genesis 2. Starting there at verse 1, Genesis 2. He didn't say evening and morning. Why? Because the Sabbath, or Saturday, the seventh day, is to be an eternal sign of his creative power. It is an eternal sign, all right? Not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. Now, that's a tragic statement. There are many among those who teach the truth to others who will not receive the seal of God in their foreheads, in the mind. All right? Not one of us will receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects of our characters. That's with the help of the Holy Spirit. To cleanse the soul, temple, of every defilement. Now is the time. What? Now is the time to prepare. The seal of God will never be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman, nor, notice this, oh, oh. Go back. All right, I will. Notice. Nor on one false tongue, one of false tongues. Now you can take that as those who sp say they speak in tongues or you can, or those who lie or deceitful hearts. Thus, beloved, God sends to the world a calling out message. Let's, let's read Revelation 18. Are you there? Revelation 18. And here's what we find in Revelation 18, starting at verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lighted with his glory. God is going to say, this is the way, walk ye in it. It's the final time. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Babylon is first mentioned in scripture when men were building a temple. Where were they building it to? Were they building it down to the earth? Or were they trying to get to heaven? So Babylon represents man's way to heaven. It didn't work then, and it won't work now. Quickly now, Babylon has fallen because it has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird for all nations. How many? All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. That's spiritual fornication. Now, verse 4. And I heard another voice from where? Heaven. From heaven saying. What does it say? Come out of her who? My people. So here is a calling out message. God has people who have been blinded one way or another and they have tripped up and are going the wrong way. 
So in his mercy, God sends a message, and the earth is lighted with his glory. That's the glory of the gospel. Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Finally, the time will come, beloved, where the gospel will have reached what God considers the ends of the world. And then he calls his people out. Make your decision. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God is going to punish that system that would dare to lead people to the false way of Babylon, saying, this is the way you can get to heaven. Babylon never did get to heaven. Thus, beloved, man has another message. You're in Revelation. Go to Revelation 13. Look at verse 15 through 18. Revelation 13, verse 15 through 18. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship. So it becomes an issue of worship. Should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand, that's service, or in his head, or in his forehead. That's commitment linked intellectually. Here is wisdom. Verse 18, here is wisdom. Here's understanding. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. God calls this system a beast. For his number is a, the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, just before Christ comes in 2 Thessalonians 2nd chapter, he sends, in conjunction with what we've read, he sends this message. 2 Thessalonians 2nd chapter. I'm going to drop down to, ver well, go, let's start at verse 2 that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us as that day of Christ is at hand. Don't get shook up. It's going to come, but it's not, it's not ready yet. Let no man deceive, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that's the end of the world day, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And you'll be able to tell that falling away. And the man of sin, the beast that has a number, it is the number of a man. John, that's what John says. Paul says, the man of sin shall be revealed. Be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. Now get this one, get, get this. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Oh my word. Oh my word. Do you realize the trouble somebody's going to get in? Somebody calling themselves God. Uh. All right. So God sends a message to the world. The message and mark of the beast. Get this. Revelation 18, 13. Here's wisdom. Here's understanding. The number of the beast is 666. Our mark of authority. The church of Rome is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. That's what they said in 1923. All right, I'm going to come up to date now. Hold on, we're almost through. The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. We've been through that. We saw that. Wait a minute. We saw that. 
The Bible says, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, no. By my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day. After all, they got, see. And lo, the entire civilized world, what, how many? The entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Now, some of you know that. Some of you have heard that. But I'm going to repeat it. I'm re the Bible said, we read it earlier. Uh, Peter said, I, I want you to remember in this world of confusion in which we live, there's, it's so easy to forget. All right, moving on. Now, Revelation says, and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called who? The devil and Satan, which deceiveth how many? That's his plan. So the Bible tells you the plan of the enemy so that you might not be tripped up by his plan. The whole world. I'm going to go back now. I want to go back. And lo, look, look where we are. And lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverent obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Now compare that with your Bible, which your, and your Bible says, and the great dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, dece which deceiveth the whole world. Lord, have mercy. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That's why we have so much trouble down here. Got the devil and his angels down here. All right? Hasn't the Catholic Church changed? You know, they have this new pope. What's his name, Francis? Well, Francis is a very nice man. People are flocking back to the church. Hasn't, hasn't the Catholic Church changed? Not at all. No change. The Second Vatican Council teaches that the Bishop of Rome, that's the Pope, as the Vicar of Christ, representative of Christ, and has supreme and universal power over the whole church. That's over Protestantism, Catholicism, and every other ism. That's 1993. I'm going to bring you up to date now. Coming in the future, in the summer of 1998, July 5th, Pope John Paul II issued a lengthy apostolic letter, Deus Domini, in which he urged people not only to start keeping Sunday holy. Oh, wait a minute. I thought the Bible said, remember the Sabbath, which is the seventh day. This, the Pope says, keeping Sunday holy, but to pass laws, what does it say? That will enforce it. Now that's what your Bible says is going to happen. It may happen very soon. With the, the, Democrat, or the Republican uh, setup we have. All right, now notice, notice, 2007, Pope demands respect for Sundays. That's day one. First day of the week. Jesus blessed the Sabbath, made it holy, because he kept it. Luke 4.16 says, as it was his custom, Luke 4.16, as it was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. But Pope Benedict says, has, he has appealed, he appealed for renewed respect for Sundays as he celebrated Mass, St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. All right, that's 2007. 
Now here you are, 2015. Now notice, I oh, going too fast. All right. I want to show you Pope Francis. Notice what he says. Sundays are a gift from God. Babylon represents man's way to heaven. Babylon failed in the Old Testament. Babylon will fail in the New Testament. The Pope is calling for world, the world to acknowledge and honor Sunday as a day of rest legislation that will force the world to worship and rest on Sunday would be the ideal solution. This is what we're looking forward to, beloved. This is where we are in the time of this world, and God is trying to warn his people, come out of her, my people. There are many voices clamoring to fulfill exactly such a goal, using the economy, the environment, and even the family as reasons to legislate Sunday rest. Have you heard some of that already? It's all over the news. But as I read earlier in Proverbs, beloved, God has sent us directives so we can know present truth. I'm almost finished, so don't faint now. Jesus said, Mark 7, 7 to 9, how be it in vain do they what? Worship me. Teaching what? The doctrines, the commandments of men. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. It is a vain thing to do it. I won't read the rest of it. That's the important thing. Last verse says, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. So Jesus Christ then, read, let's read it together. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Hebrews 13, verse 8. How many this morning then are saying in your heart, I'm going to hang with Jesus? If that's your testimony, beloved, stand to your feet. You won't embarrass me if you don't want to stand, but if that's your testimony, you want to follow Jesus, you want to stand with him, you want to finally and at last look upon his face and hear from his own lips, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you. We thank you for the truth as it is in Jesus. We don't want to be lost, Lord. We know the matter is a serious matter whom we will obey. You've set forth in your book, the truth as it is in Jesus. You've said he is our example and we should walk in his steps. This morning, Heavenly Father, we're asking your people, according to your words in Scripture, come out of her, my people, and walk with me. If you've heard that word and Jesus was here personally and he's asking you beloved to follow him are you ready to make that decision if you're ready to make that decision just raise your hand and say Lord I choose to follow you may God bless you God bless you Heavenly Father, you see the hearts and hands that are raised. 
We ask, Heavenly Father, that the Holy Spirit will bless us to that decision stays with us till we see thee face to face. So bless us to this end, we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name. And the church said...